If you didn't watch my last video, you should probably start there because that kind of talks about what lantern flies are and what the problem is and that kind of stuff. Today, we are going to be talking about the lantern fly solutions, what you can do to help, some biocontrol, and just some general practices that we're using to be able to control the spotted lantern fly. So without further ado, let's get into the video. Does anything eat it? Can we eat it? And are there any biocontrol programs? The first issue at hand is are they even toxic? I've been finding mixed reports on their toxicity. Uh, from what I can tell, if your dog eats them, they're fine. They're not going to affect your dog. They could possibly be distasteful. We do know that the tree of heaven, which they need to complete their life cycle, has toxins in it. They are brightly colored, so that should suggest that they're at least toxic or maybe at the very least distasteful. They are not considered dangerous. People don't eat them, although they are used in Chinese medicine because they are considered poisonous there. They don't have a ton of natural predators, to be honest. We do have some evidence of praying mantises and spiders and assassin bugs eating them. Chickens will eat them, but chickens pretty much literally get anything. I literally watched a chicken swallow an entire frog here in Ecuador, and that was surprising. And there is some anecdotal evidence that squirrels may be eating them, but regardless, these predators are generalists as well. So they're not targeting spotted lantern flies, and they're not doing enough control to really matter. That at the end of it, yeah, sure, like a spider catches a few and like maybe a squirrel eats one and some chickens eat a few. But at the end of the day, they're not doing anything to significantly reduce the population in any meaningful way. So stuff eats them, doesn't matter. Hello, and by the way, welcome back to my channel. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Nancy. I am an entomologist, which means that I study insects. And I live in Quito, Ecuador, where I am doing bug tours so tourism focused on insects if you think that is interesting and want to visit ecuador be sure to follow me on the social medias and check out my website don't forget to like and subscribe and do all the things i always forget to ask but please like and subscribe and do all the things it really helps out the channel anyway let's get into today's topic now let's move into some more targeted control including parasitoids parasites pathogens diseases fungus all that kind of stuff we're gonna first look at parasitoids. For those of you who don't know, a parasitoid is in this case a wasp, although any insect that lays its egg inside another insect, it must kill that insect to complete its life cycle. That's how it's different than a parasite because a parasite can just like live in you for a while, but these parasitoids will eventually always ultimately kill their host, which makes them very appealing biocontrols. This lifestyle makes parasitoids in general very appealing for biological control because they are very targeted and they can only survive on that specific host. Basically, you have targeted pest control. There's a few parasitoids that we're looking at. One is already in North America and it is a parasitoid on the gypsy moths. We're trying to look for better names for the gypsy moths. If you're interested in that, you can check out ESA, better common name project down there. Anyway, so this parasitoid is a known parasitoid of gypsy moths. However, we have seen it lay its eggs on the egg masses of the spotted lantern fly. Again, not really enough to really matter. Only 7% of egg masses are infected with this particular wasp. So again, it's not doing a whole ton to really help us a lot. There are two potential candidates from China that are already controlling this insect in their native range. It's important to note, as I mentioned, that the spotted lanternfly is not a pest in China or in other areas of Asia. And we think that it's because mainly because of these biocontrol agents or these parasitic wasps that are keeping their populations in control. Only when there's a big boom or a big you know, population explosion do you start to see that they become a little bit of a pest, but then everything balances out again and we're back to normal the next year. One of these parasitic wasps is a parasite on the egg, so it will lay its egg inside the egg of the spotted lanternfly, and the other is a parasitoid of the second and third instar nymphs, and so the wasp will come over and lay an egg inside the insect once it's already hatched, once it's developed a little bit. Again, these two are really promising because they are already controlling the populations in China where they're native to. We're also looking into other types of pathogenic fungus. 
Researchers at Cornell are looking into related species within two genera that we know attack insects. The first genera of fungus that we're looking into is Entomophaga, and the second genus is Bioveria. We do know that they seem to attack the lanternflies. We do have photographic evidence of this, but again, how much and how effective are they? I feel like once we get enough pieces to the puzzle, we'll have enough things doing enough damage to the lanternflies that hopefully we can bring them into control. Biocontrol, especially with these parasitic wasps from China, is kind of far off. We've made a lot of mistakes in the past with biocontrol, <laughs> looking at you cane toad in Australia. So there are a lot of protocols now to make sure that we don't accidentally make the problem worse. There's a lot of testing that has to be done in laboratories and there's a lot of testing that has to be done in specific controlled field sites before it's released. We need to know things like how quickly can it spread? Does it even attack the thing that we want it to? Does it prefer to attack that thing over other things, <laughs> looking at you cane toad in Australia, <laughs> can it even establish in this new place? Sometimes pests establish just fine, but sometimes it's predators and parasites don't. And we have to make sure that it's not only targeting the thing that we want it to, but also not attacking other things as well. So there's like a couple like, you know, it could attack the thing and just that, which would be awesome. It could attack that thing and other things, which would be a problem. And it could completely ignore the pest that we want it to control and attack a bunch of other things. So you can see how they're like kind of gets complicated. So you need a lot of tests to make sure all of that stuff isn't going to be happening. I did have a question about genetically modifying these insects. I mean, we're working on genetically modified mosquitoes and that seems to be going pretty well. So why don't we just do genetically modified lanternflies? And part of the reason why that is so successful with mosquitoes is because mosquitoes are a problem worldwide and they've been a problem for so long. And there's so much money and funding going into it that we can spend the money and the time and have the resources to come up with more creative solutions like genetically modifying the mosquitoes. They're very expensive, they take a long time to test, and they get a lot of public pushback. And all of these factors reduce the efficacy of using these genetically controlled mosquitoes, especially that of the public. If the public is not on board with your genetically modified sterilized insect, then it makes it really hard to do release programs, to do testing, etc., etc. If you're interested in learning more about the genetically modified mosquitoes, I have a video up here and you feel free to watch it. I like the genetically modified mosquitoes because they are a targeted solution to a problem that we are treating with broad spectrum insecticides, which ends up killing a lot of native stuff, is bad for the environment and can create insecticide resistance and et cetera, et cetera. The more targeted your control is, the better. So basically we don't have the time or the money or the resources yet to do genetically modified spotted lantern flies. So it's probably not going to happen. Maybe not ever, but definitely not soon. So now that we talked about all of that, like what are some solutions to the problem? <laughs> As I mentioned, their spread in the United States is kind of inevitable at this point. So now we're just doing damage control. Of course, the best solution to any of these problems is to make sure they never happen in the first place. With global trade comes inevitable difficulties. And I do believe that some of the responsibility lies within the federal government to make regulations about what can and cannot come in. Again, APHIS has a lot of permits and APHIS is the government agency responsible for looking at and examining the shipping containers, but we already talked about how ineffective that is. Australia and New Zealand just ban a whole ton of stuff, everything from food to natural products. And that is because they need to preserve their ecosystems. And they found the best way to do that is to just not let anything in. You just, you, that's it, that's it. Pretty simple. <laughs> it's annoying for the people who live there who may not be able to get some of the products that they want. But on the other hand, the Australian government is doing a really good job at protecting its unique ecosystems. So it's just a question of what is more important to us, preserving our native ecosystems and potentially preventing invasive species from entering or having a whole bunch of stuff available to us due to global trade. It's literally a trade-off. Hilarious. I'm hilarious.
You as the consumer can make smarter decisions. I don't like putting the blame or the responsibility directly on consumers, but if this is something that you are interested in and is important to you, you can make sure that you're shopping locally and that you're buying things that are locally sourced. And you can also make sure that you're not transporting any of these high risk items like firewood across state lines. You can also follow the Pennsylvania State Department of Agricultural Guidelines. This includes tracking and reporting sightings. If you find a spotted lanternfly in a state that is not yet on the list, keep it alive and mail it to the State Department of Agriculture because they need to register it and then register that new state in which it was found in. Everywhere else, the State Department of Agriculture of Pennsylvania is recommending that you kill it. I know as an entomologist, I never like recommending that we kill in insects and it may be really confusing when you hear like oh we need to protect insects but now the state department of agriculture is telling you to kill them like what is really going on here and it's always best to follow the state guidelines about what to do in cases of invasive species in this case the experts in pennsylvania who are dealing with this on a daily basis are telling us that if we can kill them we should and you can collect them, and I have a friend making jewelry out of them. You can freeze them if you don't like smushing them. Uh, freezing insects is the most humane way to kill them. They don't feel pain like we do. Reference in the reference section. They don't feel pain. The freezer basically just makes their metabolism slow down, they go to sleep and eventually they die, and then you can mail them to my friend to make beautiful jewelry out of. You can look for egg masses around your property so that way you can remove them and you have less chance of hatching in the spring because they won't exist because you got rid of them. So check your property really good. Again, vertical surfaces they love. You can remove the tree of heaven. Remember that the tree of heaven is a non-native invasive tree species in which this non-native invasive lanternfly needs to feed on to complete its life cycle. So get rid of it if it's in your yard. I did read a study about how quote unquote mechanical control, which is the scientific way of saying smushing it, can be difficult because they jump and fly. So there are some traps that you can build. Here are two examples of traps that you can build out of a water bottle or one out of a tool. And they both capitalize on the insect's natural behavior. And I'll link these in the reference section below. There has been some debate about using sticky traps. If you use sticky traps, it's sometimes the adult lanternflies are powerful enough that they can just jump off of them. And so they may collect more native species, which necessarily isn't the best. I've seen some evidence to suggest that you can put some chicken wire around the sticky traps to make sure that native stuff isn't getting stuck to them. But me personally, I think that's a little risky. I would do like the water bottle trap or remove the egg masses or remove the tree of heaven from your yard. If you are in industry, what's good news is that the spotted lanternfly responds really well to broad spectrum pesticides. If you are using pesticides to control the spotted lanternfly, please make sure that you are doing it in accordance to your state laws and you are doing it in accordance to the instructions on the pesticide and or you are getting a professional to do it. Because what can happen is that you can develop insecticide resistance. Hopefully with enough spotted lanternflies in the forest, there's enough genetic mixture that we're not likely to see insecticide resistance at least anytime soon. So that's good news, but you also just don't wanna be blasting them with insecticides. The problem with these broad spectrum insecticides is they are just that, they are broad spectrum, which means they are killing everything, including the spotted lantern fly. So that's not like, it's the best we've got right now, but hopefully we can come up with something a little bit better in the future, like these biocontrols that are targeted and not killing all of the things. Training your staff to be able to identify spotted lantern flies in all of their stages from adults to the nymphs to the eggs is going to be really helpful as your staff can then like, you know, physically remove the eggs and notify you as soon as they see that there are spotted lantern flies so you can take care of the problem early. And then if you are selling agricultural products of any kind, there are temporary bans on some of them, like on some wood products, for example. So you are going to want to check to make sure that whatever you are selling is in compliance with the advice from the State Department of Agriculture that you're in. I wish that I could end this video on a positive note being like, yeah, we've got solutions for you. Like, don't even worry, it's not that big of a deal. 
But in some ways, I really think this is a much bigger deal than the Asian Giant Hornet, which has gotten a lot more press. I don't really have any good solutions for us. Unfortunately, this insect reproduces quickly. It has a large potential range that it can spread to and it's spreading there quickly. While insecticides are a good option for people who are in the agricultural spaces, it may not be a good option for Joe Schmo, who doesn't want to put insecticides on his lawn for whatever reason. He has pets, he has kids, he likes to protect the environment, doesn't want to kill the native stuff that's there, you know? So the logistics of controlling this insect over such a large area and over such a wide variety of habitats is challenging, to be honest. I'm really hopeful for things like biocontrol, and I really hope that these two parasitoid wasps that we're looking at from China can actually help us control the situation. It's important to note that whatever solution we find, eradication or getting completely rid of the spotted lanternfly in North America is, I would say, impossible. I mean, technically nothing is impossible, but it, it's very, very, very unlikely to the point of being practically impossible just because it spread so far and now it's just, it's just here. It just is. So now we're trying to control its population in manageable levels. And that's what we've got. So I hope that I answered your questions. If you have any other questions about the spotted lanternfly, please leave them down below in the thought box. I do know that this is a long video. If you want to look into any of my references, I have been showing them on screen, but of course they are also in the reference section below. All right, love bugs. I will see you very soon in another video. And until then, uh, here's some other videos of mine that I've checked out. The YouTube algorithm has picked this one just for you. And I will see you all very soon. Bye.